The Nutritional Research Foundation supported a study done about 10 years ago where we checked the, the omega-3 index of 100, about 150, I think it was 160 vegans. And we found the majority of them, about 66% have levels below four. Because I used to think that it's better to have your level be above four. For, for maximizing brain size and brain health. But, in the, but since then, in the last decade, we've seen more studies to show um, increased lifespan, lower risk of inflammation from xenobiotics, which are toxic compounds like pesticides and chemicals that can damage the brain, more protection against chemical damage to the brain, and more protection against cognitive impairment and shrinkage of the brain with levels above five and above six. So I've moved gradually over the years to recommending people take their levels um, supplement accordingly to keep their levels above four. Then I changed it to five, and now I'm trying for myself and other people I'm advising to have their omega-3 index be above six. And how, for the average person, what dose do you think is required to get from 4%? If someone's listening now and they're yes. thinking, oh, I've been following that style plant-based diet for a decade or a couple of decades, but I haven't been taking DHA, EPA. Right. So maybe they're at 4% or lower right. and they want to get to six or a little bit higher. Right. What dosage are, the, are we thinking? Uh, I don't know that answer because there's such a strong genetic factor in your ability to convert the ALA from flax seeds, walnuts, and greens into EPA and then DHA. The conversion is very poor for most people. They don't convert very well. But some people do convert adequately. I've seen people take no supplements and have levels of seven or eight. And I'm shocked they take, so in other words, the dose is dependent on individual need. And, some, and, and of course, um, the supplement that I developed, which um, has about 250 milligrams of EPA and DHA, and it gets most people in that favorable range, but it still leaves about a third of individuals requiring a little bit extra. In the standard dose, you know what I mean? It gets most people in that standard range. So, um, so mo mostly we recommend about, if you add up the DHA and EPA together, about 250 for most people gets them up to above, you know, above 5.5 or above six. That conversion difference, the genetic, I guess, differences that exist out there, yeah. is that likely a, re a result of whether your ancestors were eating fish or not? So perhaps if they weren't eating any fish, you have a better conversion rate you can convert more ALA to DHA and EPA I'd be guessing you know I, I it's could, a theory it's a theory I wouldn't know, really know the answer to that question but um, there's a lot of genetic variabilities there's a lot of genetic variabilities with the utilization of zinc and copper a lot of genetic variabilities with the utilization of people as they know with um, b12 and methylation of uh, and your, whether you're uh, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of individual differences that to be a physician that has the ability to really help an individual who's not thriving, you have to be able to inquire, examine, and even test to see what has to be changed in this person's program to make sure they thrive and get well. And that's what you learn through many decades of experience. You know, I supplement with DHA, EPA from algae oil myself. Have you checked your omega-3 index to see I'm where- I'm about to measure it this week. Okay. Found a company here in the States. I couldn't, couldn't find one in, in Australia, but I'm, I'm interested to see where it's at. Because you have to take the, that dose you're taking right now for at least three months, preferably four months, and then check it because it takes, um, because the red blood cells have a 120 day half life. Sure. Yeah. So they have to circulate around enough so they can reflect what you're taking. And then you can see if the levels, what the level is, if you need to take a little more or a little less. Right. You know, you know? Yeah. I think that's a good way for people to navigate it. Yeah. It's a very objective way, which considers your genetics and whatever dose you're taking. Right. I've been taking that daily for. Gosh, five plus years. Okay. So more than long enough to, so you're probably good. to get an accurate kind of yeah. um, measurement there. Why do you think, I mean, this is still not accepted by everyone. There are some people within the plant-based community that may argue against this position and say, you don't need DHA, EPA. Is, is more studies required, do you think, to get everyone on board? Or no. can you argue their position? Do you see their position? that no. they would be taking? Not really. I think it's a, um, you know, you have radicalism on all, th on all for, um, fields. In other words, we have many people that think it's good to eat a diet of all meat. And no matter how many studies we present, we're not gonna change their mind about, not, about a diet of eating a, a meat diet or a paleo diet or a keto diet. You know, we have a lot of evidence showing cumulative the last five years of those keto and paleo diets, high meat diets being dangerous. But that's not going to change these people's mind because they can find some information they can cling to 
that supports what they want to eat and what they want to think. And there are many people in the plant-based movements that have been indoctrinated like a religion. And for them, it's a philosophy, not a science. They're not flexible in changing their viewpoint with new accumulating evidence. They'll look for any pearl, any information they can to justify their prior viewpoints. And I think they're, um, philosophically, I think they want to hail the purity of the, of the vegan or the plant-based diet and not to admit or realize this might be some flaws or weaknesses potentially in it. So I think they'd be resistant. I don't think more evidence would be helpful because there's been that degree of evidence has already been presented. There's been so many studies that corroborate each, each other so that the credence is extremely high at this point. By credence, we mean that when a study is done with a large number of people and followed for, for a lot, long period of time, and you see a certain outcome, well, then you see the other studies corroborate that and show the same thing. And how many studies are necessary for you to think it's valuable? 10, three, four, five, 10? Are there outlying studies that show otherwise? You know, so we're saying here that they're making arguments that are illogical. Like they'll say things like, well, vegans don't have more dementia than people who are um, on a standard diet. So why would we think vegans that are low on omega-3 would have be a cause of dementia? Because that's another irrelevant argument because, of course, vegans don't have more dementia because the standard American diets have much more causes of dementia. The but question is, do, could they do better again? Yeah, yeah so it's irrelevant. So even if, even if it was five out of 100 that got dementia, you still wouldn't even want them to get dementia. We want to protect those five out of 100. That whole argument is... Um, so the arguments they give, or, or um, oh, it takes so long for the DHA to enter the brain, or it takes, you know, or you give people with advanced dementia a drug, it doesn't show benefit. They're missing the whole point. It's not, and they're, they're going to try to focus on an argument and convince themselves or their followers who are, you know, who have their, you know, almost like religious zeal for the viewpoint of whoever they want to follow. And it's, and there's very, you know, you have to have a, um, a mind that, or a purpose to be able to weigh evidence. It's like politics. People can't weigh evidence and weigh science. They're too based on their predetermined biases. And I'm saying at this point, it's quite um, irresponsible to be able to take risk with people's brains and to try to convince them that they should ignore being low on a blood test and a nutrient that's linked to shrinkage of the brain you know, how, we have so many studies that show that low levels are linked to shrinkage of the brain and cognitive impairment. You're just going to tell your followers to ignore those studies and just, and just be comfortable with a low level. To me, that's just irresponsible. If you can't convince those people, what can you do? You do the best I'm you can. I'm with you. I think yeah. that the best thing you can do is point out limitations yeah. of a diet to help people navigate that and optimize their diet yeah. and improve those health outcomes as best as they can. Is there any risk? Are there any adverse effects or risks with supplementation of DHA, EPA? Um, not in the type of dosing we're talking about. There is with people taking high dose fish oils. You know, so in other words, a fish oil capsule can be a gram and some people can take three or four grams a day to thin their blood or to lower their triglycerides and some cardiologists recommend and prescribe that. But you have some potential risks with taking such high dosages. Um, but not, and that's more of a pharmacologic dose looking to lower, and not in a nutritive dose that we're talking about to keep your level between six and nine, let's say. So the answer is no, that the more recent, more comprehensive studies have shown that being in that adequate window of DHA in, intake actually also is linked to all cause increases in mortality, it all cause decreased mortality and all cause increases in longevity. So that having a a, a higher level is linked to lower rates of cancer and lower rates of heart, disease, heart attacks and, of course, protection of the brain. So you live longer in general and you have less, more resilience to toxic toxins from the environment with a higher level. That doesn't mean with any nutrient, like vitamin D, low levels might be, benef might be harmful, but excess amounts could be harmful. I mentioned that in one of my books. I showed studies that low levels of DHA were linked to atrial fibrillation in the blood, but levels get too high, they can actually increase the risk of atrial fibrillation with too high a level as well. There's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot, yes, for every new, for almost all nutrients. The Okinawans, traditional Okinawans, their omega-3 index is about eight to 10%, somewhere in that ballpark. And they seem to do pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say though that the blue zones and the Okinawans and the other blue zones are not examples of optimal health. And they don't have optimal human lifespans. 
because their diet is just socially and culturally what's and what's foods indigenous to that area and what they've lived on culturally. Because we can design a diet with features that are more have more scientific integrity to really maximally slow aging and promote um, push that envelope of human longevity. So I'm suggesting that my experience has been um, that we that humans should be able to live between 97 and 107 years old with predictable with, if they have enough periods of their life, enough decades of living healthy living. And, and I'm saying this from my experience taking care of elderly people who are following this way of life and haven't lived this way since birth. But in any case, in most of the blue zones, they're only getting six to eight years of extended lifespan, not the you know 15 to 18 years of extended lifespan that I'm talking about. What about the potentially Adventists? Possible. How much extra life do the Adventists get? They get around eight to 10 years as well. And, and, and I know from living and, and being and visiting and spending time with them, a lot of them are not eating ideally just because they're on plant-based diets. And of course, as you know, the Adventists are such a great group to study because some of them are vegans and some are near vegans, flexitarians, pescatarians, ovo lacto, and some eat animal products in small amounts. So you can study a lot of different cohorts doing different things and compare the two. So the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study too, and all the data they've published, I consider a gold standard of excellent research that we can learn a lot from. Why do you think that the pescatarians in the latest study I've seen from AHS2, mm -hmm. they seem to do the best in terms of lifespan? Does mm -hmm. that come back to, to DHA EPA, you think? Yes. So the, the question is, that leads to an a good question. If DHA is so important, then what's better to have a little seafood or fish in your diet or to just take a supplement? And I'm suggesting that at this point in my career, um, I think it's much more, it's much safer to take a supplement than to eat fish. It might have been the case 20, 30 years ago, um, but now we have so much runoff from farming, from commercial farming, so much algae bloom in, in waterways and oceans and, and estuaries, so much overgrowth of cyanobacteria, so much dumping of plastics. There's this compound called BMAA, which has infiltrated the population of, of, of bivalves. Bivalves are oysters, mussels, scallops, and clams, right? And shellfish like lobster and, and crabs, the bottom feeders, that have, higher, that have such high levels of BMAA that they're actually showing clustering of ALS and higher risk of Parkinson's dementia, um, PDS, Parkinson's dementia syndrome. That's in, been published? That's been published. That's wow. linked to people in, that live near lakes or near estuaries that were eating more, eating more bivalves. Is that, is that farmed and wild? Farmed and wild, yes. Interesting. I'd love to read that. Yeah. So even I'm saying that compared to fish, that these bivalves are more dangerous potentially to the brain and to the neurologic and to being poisoned. Super to, interesting. Yeah. So, so given the plastic compounds, I used to think that, you know, big fish like, like um, swordfish and tuna are polluted with, with mercury, but the little things, sardines, a couple of oysters, a couple Anchovies. of little things. Yeah, might be okay to eat to get some omega-3. But now I'm... Um, with the people having microplastic in their body, which is still an endocrine disruptor and can, can, can be a risk factor for cancer, and, the, and these toxic compounds in the estuaries and off the, from the um, algae blooms and, the pollu and pollution, it's better, to, I think, to, uh, to avoid fish. Right. It's good for people to, to know as well that the omega-3s that are in fish are originally coming from algae. Mm -hmm. It's fish feeding on the algae and, and moving its way up the food chain. Yeah, but you know, it still would work. But the question is, where do we get the cleanest source? Right. Yeah. I guess I'm just making the point that the algae oil is actually going to the to the direct source. <laughs> You're skipping the fish in the middle, right? So DHA EPA is something that your views have kind of evolved on over the last few decades. Is there anything else? Was there is there any other kind of major blind spots that you've become aware of or? Um, areas of nutrition that you think plant-based eaters need to be more aware of? The only other main factor may be zinc. Maybe some people are going to have better resistance to later life pneumonia and, the, and curtail immunosenescence, which means the weakening of immune system with aging by having more zinc adequacy. Because you still get zinc in a plant-based diet. It's just that the phytates bind zinc, so you don't get as much absorption had you have animal protein.